Welcome to our special broadcast, celebrating Black History Month. On today's program, we'll be joined by the president of the Almira Corning NAACP, Georgia Verdier. We'll hear from historian to the Tuskegee Airmen, Inc., Michael Joseph, and we'll take a very special look inside the John W. Jones Museum. Our guest was inducted into the Steuben County Hall of Fame back in 2023 for her work in the community. She's been president of the Elmira Corning NAACP for over 30 years, Georgia Verdier. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so how long have you been involved with the Elmira Corning NAACP? I've been president for 30 years, but right? I've been involved with the NAACP almost all of my life because I came from an active family of NAACPers, so, yeah. so it's kind of been a lifetime journey. How has things changed through the years, either in our local chapter or just uh, since you joined? Well, it used to be everybody was a part of that because many times there were not a whole lot of other, other organizations to be a part of, but today you have a new generation of yeah. people. There are so many other activities, so many other organizations, and so many other things going on. You, can't, you don't have the same drawing power that they had years ago, and especially for youth because mm -hmm. the youth are so involved with educational activities and things of that nature. You have to almost make an appointment with them to get to talk with them. So you can't draw them in and get them as active as that we used to be uh, be able to do. But we are trying to be uh, creative enough to have some activity that will be meaningful for them to come and participate in. So we want to touch those lives in any way we can. And as I said to you earlier, we're on a new normal. We have to learn how to adjust to the time and, and program ourselves accordingly. Mm -hmm. and, and you feel that you've adapted in that way or getting Well, there? we're trying. We're yeah. working on it like we had our Freedom Fund at the Radisson last year in June. And we're going to have it again. We gave scholarship. We brought in a lot of youth uh, for entertainment purposes, yes. like dancers and singers and all. We said, okay, if we use them, mm -hmm. they will come. And then we underwrote the cost yeah. because you got to have to do all of that too. It's not just saying, can you come? Can you afford to come? So we look for ways and meaningful ways to get them in and get them active because if they are part of it, they can feel useful. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think I was surprised to learn about the scholarship program here locally. I knew at a national level, but you've been, I'm sure, working on that for a long time and you guys did a great job with it. Well, thank you. We've been doing that for many, many, yeah. many years. And, and a few years ago, we did a survey. We've done probably thousands of students. We, we surveyed a hundred students to see how did the scholarship impact their life? Did they did it help them to move forward in terms of their educational journey? And 99% of them were good. Isn't they had great? been able to manipulate and maneuver and do whatever they yeah. needed to do to make it. So we were excited about that. So what does your role as the president of the local NAACP, what does that role involve? Leadership. Yeah. Leadership. Uh, one of the things, uh, somebody asked me, and if you saw another interview I did, asked me uh, about when I came aboard. Uh, sometimes people just happen to have a title. Yeah. See, for me, a title is just a title. You have to you have to have something to go with that. And when I felt that I was able to effectively lead the organization, that's when I took the uh, I boarded the plane called right. Changing and, <laughs> and started working with it. Um, but it, it you because one of the things it's a voluntary organization uh, position and it goes on 24 7 many right. times if you're doing criminal justice work with it that's behind the scenes and those calls come at night and they w one woke me up the other morning and I'm like oh okay and I got up with the spirit of work because I'm in the role and you have to go with it it's not gonna always be convenient right. but you you need to be as active as you can so there the, it involves work a lot of work and that's such a good point because so many people I think are looking more for that title in these yeah. organizations yeah. than putting the efforts in and that that's why when you mentioned behind the scenes, do you think people are aware of all that you do at the NAACP behind the scenes? No, no, because I, I did an annual report and sent mm. it out to the people. And they, even the people involved, didn't have a clue that we were doing <laughs> as much as we were doing. No, people don't have any idea. And what I say, too, we are just one organization, and we are out there to try to make a difference, but there are other organizations. And I said, let's pool our resources when we can, and let's all get out there and do something. Rather than talk about what others are not doing, take self-inventory and determine what are you doing to That's make a difference. So if you see an organization that not going quite as effectively as you like, come and join it and help us be effective. And so we're asking people to do that. Rather than talk about us, talk with us, and work with us. Yes. 
Now, you won the 2018 New York NAACP President's Award. That must have been felt pretty good. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was. Uh, and I was able to take a picture with the president of uh, uh, the national president. Yeah. yeah and, and that is nice because you think, well, somebody noticed that you're doing something. But that can be empty if you're not doing anything. Mm -hmm. You can p take pictures all day long <laughs> and then go home and, and go to, and watch TV. Yeah. So I like to, uh, if you see my picture out there, it means I'm out there in the mix. I'm not in the bleachers watching the game. I'm on the field playing. Yeah. And that's why I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I want you to tell us about your journey specifically because you've had some pretty amazing experiences with the NAACP. Yeah, I, uh, I've met some key people along the way. I've, I've had uh, uh, time to work. I work with former Governor Como. I work with the local governor. I, in fact, during COVID, I was on the task force for COVID, and oh um, I got a proclamation from the governor for our work. <laughs> we did a PSA, and she was able to see that. Um, and I, um, I don't know if you know this, but I was invited by Congress to go to South Africa with them uh, to do some work and some study over there. I was able to talk and talk and teach some of the kids while I was there. Uh, Congress invited me again to go to Selma with them to walk across that Edmund Pettus Bridge. And that was, those were unique experiences. I was able to rub shoulders with some people in key places, not only rub shoulders, but uh, communicate with them. Right. And I had a really good relationship with former Congressman Houghton. Yeah, and I, I volunteered with him for a lot, and John Lewis and uh, Nancy Pelosi and all of those folks. And I tried to get information. Uh, Dorothy Cotton, who was living in Ithaca, you might have heard her name. She was an educational person for Dr. King. I was able to interface with a lot of those people and get ideas, get information, uh, uh, find out what makes a good leader? What do right. I need to know in order to be an effective leader? So you learn by doing, and, and when you have the opportunity to communicate with people who are on the battlefield, you learn how to fight the battle. <laughs> You're so involved in the community, not just with NAACP, but just in general. How do you keep your passion? Looking at the problems, because yeah. see, if it was everything was very nice out there and we were at peace and all of that, you could sit back and say, there's nothing to worry about. But <laughs> there's so many challenges, so many issues, so many problems. And I believe we all need to be out there working on to, to find resolutions for them rather than uh, complaining. I, I, I said to my pastor, I want to move from the complaining team to the praise team and be a better person and do what I can do. And then I can look out and say, well, God, I've done the best I can to make a difference. And I cannot control anybody else's life, but I can be a, a, a leadership, be a role model. So somebody can say, well, at least she's out there doing something. So maybe I'll get out there. But if you're just sitting talking, they say, well, she's just a leader, but she's not doing anything. Nobody's following her. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to be able to lead with some kind of um, expertise, if I can get that, and also with some passion. Yes. So many organizations have failed because of a lack of leadership, I think. Yes. And not having the passion that you have. You know, it, I mean, we all have been a part of an organization where you meet once a month or once every couple months, but you don't feel like you're accomplishing anything. And that's the difference. At the end of the day, if you can say you accomplish something, that's what it's all about, isn't yeah. it? We take the survey, uh, uh, inventory of the community, yeah. survey of the community, uh, for a better word, and try to find out, what the, get our, our arms around the issues and concerns and try to do uh, programs of pro, uh, like TV, uh, Zoom, regarding those issues so people can tune in and find out what do I do in a situation like this or what is going on and by doing this and by having Zoom now you learn what's in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, we are community rich in Corning and Elmira mm -hmm. and I'm surprised at the many resources but if people don't know about them they don't access them. So we said let's get on these programs and let people know what is in the community so they don't have to reinvent the wheel and say well we maybe we should be giving food or doing this. Okay there's a place down the street giving food. Let, if you have some more food, let's add it to that covers, right. uh, covers and then uh, make it more. So we're looking at all of that, and we try to bring programs in different areas like uh, civic engagement, health care, education, um, whatever you, and, and you can think of, youth development, and, and teach people, uh, uh, make people aware of what their communities have to offer them and how to access uh, those resources. How does somebody get involved with Elmira Corning NAACP? Well, we're a membership-driven organization. Yes. I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> and uh, for thirty dollars a year, you can be a, a, a general member. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we have general membership. We have uh, life. We have um, a civil life. We have gold life, and we have diamond life. Those are steps you have to be. Uh, um, 
a civil life in order to go gold. You have oh, to be okay. a gold to go di diamond. I'm a diamond. I told you I lead by example. So um, you can go those routes, and they can get a membership through us by just uh, contacting us and or sending it to our address, and that is out there on the web. And they can go on a national level and get it online. Okay. And um, but we get a little bit more money if it, if they get it from us, because yeah. um, national will give us a half and half. If it, well, if you go online, they give us half and half. So oh, okay. um, we are we, uh, there are many ways for doing that, and we encourage people because many people cannot come aboard physically and help us, but if they can help us financially, that helps to get the job done. And if someone does send in the thirty dollars, they don't have any responsibility necessarily. That's just to help your organization. That, that, yeah, and that just a membership in the organization yeah and it helps us but then they they are on board and yeah. uh, we hope that hope it has meaning for them that they took out a membership because they believe we're trying to make a difference right it's not just about paying membership fees back yeah. to what you're going back to though it helps obviously like, yes. like with things like you mentioned with a scholarship that has done so many amazing things for so many people through the mm -hmm. years yes yeah um, if someone wants to move up in the chain, not just with the different membership fees, but if they want to get act actually involved in the behind the scenes, what's the best way to do that? Well, they can contact. We have election every every other year, every oh, okay. two years, and we we all have to go up again and be reelected. Every <laughs> office will be open, but we have our executive committee, and we have people on that, and we are the decision makers. We meet. Uh, the officers and the executive committee meet, meet to plan program and do a whole lot of work that has to be done uh, and I'll share with you what we're doing for a program on Saturday but if you wanted to be a member of the executive committee and you didn't get elected at during election time I can appoint you and bring you before the executive committee and they can vote you in so you don't have to wait for us to right. have an election to be a part of the executive committee have you found uh, kind of touching on what we talked about at the beginning have you found recruitment in today's day and age to be difficult very yeah very people are active they they um uh attention span short patience short okay. a whole nine and they just um they care yeah but they don't want to be that involved because right. we have a lot of uh, co uh, committees within there, like we need to have chairs for the Criminal Justice Committee, Education Committee. All of those committees need chair people and workers. And sometimes it's hard to get those people because that means you're going to be committed to doing some more work. Mm -hmm. and, but we, we don't, won't let that stop us. We just pool our resources and come together and say, okay, two or three of us are on th two or three committees, <laughs> but we can get this job done, so mm -hmm. we keep doing it. How often do you have special programs for the community? Well, we try to have them monthly, yeah, but okay. if not, every other month, as frequently as we can. But we look at other other organizations in the community, and we try to not program over them. Mm -hmm. If somebody's having a good program somewhere, we say, well, we don't need to. Let's support that. Right. So we just kind of, like I said, take the pulse of the community to see what's going on and then uh, plan programs accordingly. What would you say to encourage someone to get involved with the NAACP? Just call me up and, <laughs> and, and, and talk with me if they would like to. Because some people want to know, well, what, what does it entail? If I get involved, what, what do you expect of me? Right. Just give, well, I'll, I'll give, I'll take them on a journey mm -hmm. and let them know exactly what it entails, what they need to know, how we work, the rules, regs, and guidelines that come down from um, the national. And I'll say this to you. Many people don't know. It said there's something happened in your city and they want to do a protest. Mm -hmm. We can't just go out. You you won't see us showing up down the street just right. because it happened. We have to get permission from National, let them know mm -hmm. what has happened, get guidelines, and they have to tell us we have to get insurance, we have to get people to monitor. It, it is not like you can just show up on the street because some people say, well, they are protesting out there. Why don't you guys join them? We can't do that. We, we have rules, regs, and guidelines around that. I'll let people know all of that so they'll know you will see us when it's pro appropriate time to see us and when we can do what you're asking us to do. It's not just saying, I want to do this. It, it, we are organized, and, um, and the national try to keep us within that organization or those organizations' um, rules and guidelines. Well, thank you so much for giving us so much time. Well, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share with you. Please stay with us. We'll be right back with our special presentation celebrating Black History Month. Historian for the Claude B. Govan chapter of the Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated, Michael Joseph, is our guest on our celebration of Black History Month. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, let's start with probably the easiest question you'll get. What originally got you interested in the Tuskegee Airmen? I actually had dreams about flying in combat. Is that right? During World War II, yeah. 
Yeah. I was probably five, six years old. And that just led to your, uh, can I say, lifelong passion then? Well, more than that, I guess over time I started to read books mm -hmm. about aircraft. And um, my dad would take me to the library, and we <laughs> were following the hot programs of the day, which was Apollo, the X-15, sure. that sort of thing. And I read more and learned about World War II and World War II aircraft, which I just loved. Yes. And how long have you been with the Tuskegee Airmen, Inc.? It's about 37 years now. Is that right? Yeah. And how long before you became the historian of your chapter? So I actually I joined the chapter in 1987. I was sworn in by New York State Judge George Fleury, okay. who was actually my cousin. And um, I left that chapter and went to Atlanta because I got a job with Johnson and Johnson okay. in 1988. So I moved down there and I was a parliamentarian. I held that office in the Atlanta chapter and historian later on. And when I moved back here in 1995 to join Corning, hmm. that's when I resumed with this chapter, the Claude B. Govan chapter as chapter historian. Is historian the best job? <laughs> I'd say it's a pretty it's good be job. The it's, it's, it's interesting yeah. in that it's not always, it's not what you might typically believe is a historian's job. Okay. Well, that's right? why I wanted to ask that. What does a historian's job look like? Okay. So part of it is not only do you have a, a sense of what is going on uh, currently mm -hmm. within the Tuskegee Airmen, and as an example, I've been asked to authenticate claims that individuals are Tuskegee Airmen. Interesting. They come forward and we need to evaluate their records, their discharge papers, DD-214. We need to look them up in our database, which I hold, and I have to authenticate individuals before we will go before our national organization and say we are forwarding their application for membership within the Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated. Is that a common occurrence? Is that a... It's relatively common, Is yes. that right? Yeah. And there are people who claim to be Tuskegee Airmen who are not. Oh, and we've had horrible. to... Uh, this is one of the reasons why we've had to uh, enact uh, that evaluation process. Hmm. So a little bit about the history of the uh, Tuskegee Airmen, because we were talking and... Um, I guess the acknowledgement or the, the respect that they deserve was maybe, could you say a long time coming or maybe um, it, it, maybe we'd be surprised to learn about the Congressional Gold Medal, I suppose, being in 2016. Yeah, I, I would say that um, it's yes and no mm -hmm. because at the time of the war, they were being recognized. They won mm -hmm. two presidential unit citations for actions in combat in Europe. And after the war, when things calmed down a little mm -hmm. bit, people forgot about them mm -hmm. and said, well, you know, maybe they weren't all that good to begin with, right? Right. You know, we've heard the stories. Mm -hmm. They never lost a bomber due to enemy fighter action, which is not completely true. It's true that they were the best fighter escort organization. There were some bombers that were lost. That was inevitable. Mm -hmm. Uh, they couldn't do anything about any aircraft fly fire, right? As an example, craft that were damaged already, they couldn't save every aircraft. Hmm. But yes, they had an excellent combat record. After the war, they got, uh, they came under fire because people were saying, well, you guys didn't have any aces. You know, pilots yep. that shoot down five planes, you become an ace, it's a big deal, you get your name and your picture in the paper. Well, due to the tactics that they used, where they focused on escorting the bombers and not going after individual kills and glory, yeah. they did not have aces. That's interesting. Right? Mm -hmm. So the naysayers said they weren't good shots. Mm. But in 1949, the Air Force said the new Air Force said we will get all of the fighter squadrons and groups the best of the best and we're gonna have a fighter gunnery competition and we will see no who is the best of the best and the Tuskegee Airmen came out number one in the conventional 
aircraft, propeller powered uh, aircraft, flying P 47 Thunderbolt N models. Yeah. Oh, so amazing. Did it, have you found that the Tuskegee Airmen, it became after uh, the war a brotherhood? Did they stay close or were they one of those things where it didn't start that way and now it ended into this brotherhood? Well, the Tuskegee Airmen, they tended to, to cluster in groups around the larger cities. Okay. And they, um, you know, some, uh, they formed strong bonds mm -hmm. during the war years. Yeah. And after they settled in similar places, and you have to remember, there were a lot of them, relatively, not many people realize this, but there were 15,500 wow. of these people that we call Tuskegee Airmen today. So there were a lot of them. So you have your work cut out for you, <laughs> verifying everyone. Well, you know, we, our, our database, you know, there was a, a fire at um, the place where they keep the records. Mm. It was a, a base, I'm thinking, I'm not remembering the name of the base right now, but in the early 70s, most of those records were lost. And so it was uh, one of our men in the California chapter spent 20 years reconstructing the database and found, because we thought there were only 10,000 right. or so Tuskegee Airmen, he found another 5,000 500 plus people and the reason for this is uh, it wasn't just at Tuskegee where people were there were several bases throughout the states where people were getting trained not just fighter pilots but multi-engine pilots B-25s and and so people were getting trained to do every conceivable job right. needed on an air base so for every 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 pilot you need about 15, 14, 15 people to support the base operations. How rewarding has this experience been for you? I know it's been an, uh, essentially a lifelong, long, mm -hmm. excuse me, lifelong uh, process, but as historian of your chapter, how rewarding has it been? I, I think my association with the Tuskegee Airmen, In Airmen Inc. Sure. has been, uh, well, I'll tell you what happened, and you can tell me okay. how rewarding you think it is. <laughs> so I met my first Tuskegee Airmen when I was about 23, 24 years old. I went to a historical society meeting in New Jersey, and my friend, best friend Alfred and I, we tried to get there. We had never been out of the city on our own, <laughs> and we were late. We, the place had closed, and a few months later, they opened back up again. We went and got a chance to talk to Tuskegee Airmen from this New York chapter. It was 1983, 1983, 84. I was 23, 24 years old, and I met, I met these men yeah. for the first time. And I tell you, years before, up until I was about 17 or so, I didn't even know if there were any left alive. Sure. But over time, I began to find that even in my own family, I had Tuskegee Airmen relatives. Wow. I never knew. Our, the World War II experience was different for black people. When they came back from the war, they did not receive uh, the free lunch and dinner <laughs> from one end of the country to the other, sure. the pats on the back. It was, especially in the South, like one of my friends, Dabney Montgomery, told me when he went to a restaurant, when he went back home to um, his home in Alabama, Selma, they told him, you know, go, you got to go in the back. You got to go in the back way. You can't go in the front door of this restaurant. And he said, I served in Italy. I served my country in Italy. I don't care if you went to Italy. Wow. Get in the back. <laughs> and that's how it was. Some of these men were stripped of their uniforms by mobs, by racist mobs, and killed. Hmm. You know, American servicemen. You know, it, so yeah. yeah, there were some, there were some challenges. That that experience was different. So a lot of black people, my generation, hmm. whose fathers, uncles, cousins served during the war, they never knew. Their parents never told them. Wow. Wow. 
I can see why you've got the passion for it because uh, just hearing all of this, is that why uh, when you went to that first event, you got to meet uh, a Tuskegee Airman, why you eventually started, I don't know if you started, but got these amazing events in our area? Oh, it was a long path. Yeah. For one thing, Neville Emanuel, who went to school with my dad back in the 1940s, Neville became an engineer, okay. and he worked at Rome Labs. They used to call it RADC, Rome Air Development Center. It's now the United States Air Force Research Laboratories. He got there in 1959 or so, and he met people like Herbert Thorpe. Yeah, just, Herbert Thorpe mm. was a research engineer at the old RADC. Another gentleman, John Dove, was also at RADC back in those days. And when I came along, in the early 70s, it was uh, Neville Emanuel that was telling me about the Tuskegee Airmen and telling me, you know, he says, I know the national president, I'll introduce you, which he did. Yeah. And Gina Squarey, who was an executive at Grumman Aerospace Corporation, Gene uh, invited me to join the chapter. And that was my, my first formal introduction. And that was 1987. Okay, and uh, talking about it locally, because you've put on amazing events and, and things that I think um, so many people that are watching this right now are familiar with. I was surprised to learn that the first event locally was in 1997. How many have you had yeah. since then? If uh, you, uh, so depending on the size, yeah. you know, large and small, there have probably been, I'd say more than a dozen. Yeah. You know, um, uh, large events, probably about, about seven, yeah. seven large events. Presentations, uh, a lot of different presentations. If we go out to schools, oh my gosh, dozens, dozens of talks at, at local schools, churches, and so forth. I'm glad that you mentioned that because I was wondering, uh, especially in the Tuskegee Airmen, Inc., how do you get the info and, and the history to the young people? Yeah. Is, has, have you found that to be very difficult? Well, there are challenges associated yeah. with that. For one thing, young people, you have to reach them where they live. Right. And, you know, we've, I've done over 100 presentations over these right. years. And what I've found is you, you really need to start talking to people at a, at a level they can understand. Uh, as Lee Archer was one of our great proponents of the Tuskegee Airmen. Lee... He shot down four enemy aircraft during World War II, and he was uh, vice president of General Foods. Lee was talking to one of our corporate sponsors who said, you know, you guys have to be more than just World War II fighter pilots. Right. You have to be more. And what we're finding now is, uh, particularly in light of our original Tuskegee Airmen passing on, mm -hmm. we have so much to share with the world about what these people have done that have touched every American life. Mm -hmm. So when I talk to people, I talk about Alton Burton, P.E. Alton Burton was a Tuskegee Airman. He was a navigator bomb bombardier flying B-25 bombers. Mm -hmm. After the war, he got his engineering degree. He was handpicked by Rockefeller to lead the World Trade Center project, okay. the building mm -hmm. project. In 1964, he began work on that project, and he was a member of my chapter. He was a classmate <laughs> with Herbert Thorpe, yeah. and I brought those two together in about 2008. They didn't know. They hadn't seen each other since 1946, Wow! and I brought them together. I uh, flew uh, Alton in, him and his wife, yeah. Vashti Burton. And I sent a limousine out to uh, Rome, New York, and got Herb and his wife, Jessie, brought them together at the conference room without telling them yeah. who was who. And they just kind of <laughs> circled each other, yeah. and they, you know, started to see that 20-year-old that they <laughs> used to know. And, yeah, yeah, that, that was fun. You that must have had so many amazing experiences like that. Oh, yeah, very many. Yeah. Very many. You mentioned the chapters. How many chapters are there in total? So there are about 50 chapters in the United States today. Okay. And a couple thousand 
of the new Tuskegee Airmen. Yeah. How does somebody become a member? What you can do is find out where your chapter is nearest to you, mm -hmm. and you go online, take a look at Tuskegee Airmen, Inc., and uh, if you do that search, you'll find the various chapters. Now, my chapter is the Claude B. Govan Tri-State Chapter. Okay. We're New York, New Jersey, Connecticut-based. Okay. And so there are a couple of New York chapters, but, but our chapter is that New York area. And I want to go through quite a few things here before we wrap up, but mm -hmm. kind of uh, before we get into some specifics, what would you recommend to somebody that wants to learn more about the Tuskegee Airmen? Where do they begin? Yeah. Well, the, the easiest place these days is to get on the internet. <laughs> yeah. you know? It's everywhere. Yeah. Look on uh, YouTube. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, find out what's going on. You'll see stuff. You'll see images. You'll see videos. Um, look up Faithful Pursuit, the Tuskegee Airmen's Faithful Pursuit. You'll find that our car was the Tuskegee Airmen's first official race slash show car yeah. dedicated here 2004, April. General Mike Hall presided over the ceremony and we had seven original Tuskegee Airmen that were participating in that dedication of the display at the Wings of Eagles Discovery Center yeah. and our unveiling. And um, yeah, so look up things like that. You'll find there's just so much information yeah. out there but you want to get the truth there are certain things that have been misrepresented mm -hmm. about the Tuskegee Airmen the the best place to get the information is go to the Air Force the Air Force has an official site you can learn about the Tuskegee Airmen through the Air Force you can call me Michael Joseph mm -hmm. I've been around for a long time <laughs> Some of the Tuskegee Airmen have not even been in Tuskegee Airmen, Inc. as long as I have. Right? Because some guys, they're busy with their careers. They're doing whatever sure. it is they have to do. I recruited Herb Thorpe. <laughs> Herb yeah. uh, was 80 I'm so when he remember. joined TAI. Is that right? 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's talk about that because people probably wonder about the pictures in the background and, and the ones that we've been showing on the screen. Tell us about uh, Lieutenant Thorpe. Yes. Well, Herbert Thorpe, he was a dear friend. Yeah. Uh, I met Herbert Thorpe at another friend's funeral in Rome. The, uh, the great inventor, the late great John Dove, passed away. I sat on his board of directors of Dove Photonics. And um, at the funeral, Herbert Thorpe was introduced to me as a Tuskegee Airman. I found cur that curious because no one had ever heard of him. But he was a very quiet, humble guy, and he never... People outside of Rome really didn't know who he was. So I brought him into our chapter and, and encouraged him to participate. And he has been to so many events. We flew to events together. We drove. We went to Albany. He was recognized by both sides of the house. He, uh, uh, and a few years after that, I realized that he never got his congressional gold medal really? at all of the... Yeah. Tuskegee Airmen received when they went to the Capitol Rotunda, and I think it was 2016 or so. And so, no, it, w it was earlier than that. Uh, 2008, maybe, something. Um, but we had a ceremony in Geneseo where some of the Tuskegee Airmen local to this area yeah. who had never gotten their medals were awarded their congressional gold medals. So the ceremony... Where you see Herb saluting here, this is that Congressional Gold Medal Ceremony. And um, it was 2016 at the National Warplane Museum in Geneseo. And he was a great friend of that museum and that activity. And we had a wonderful time there. Patriot Guard riders must have stood about 100 flags at that event. Oh, wow. And I've got great photographs yeah. of that. It was just so beautiful. And, you know, we had anticipated that Herb might be around for the 20th anniversary of the unveiling of the Faithful Pursuit race car and the display at the Wings of Eagles Discovery Center. In anticipation that he might not be able to travel, 
we went to Rome on December 20th of 2023, and we did an interview to be telecast mm -hmm. at that event, April 25th, 2024. So this is a photograph of him holding a P-47 Thunderbolt fighter. Look at him, he looks yeah. like a big kid. He does. And this guy. <laughs> so nice. Herb was so amazing because up until virtually two days before he died, you wouldn't know that anything was wrong with him. He was always laughing, joking, happy. At his 100th, at his 100th birthday, I asked him, what do you do? What do you eat? <laughs> You know, uh, <laughs> any special exercise? Yeah. No, just, you know, he'll go to wherever and have lunch with his buddies, and he just, that, he's just active. Yeah. You know, very Amazing. active guy. And, and I'm glad also that you mentioned that event, April 25th, Wings of Eagles. Will that be open to anyone? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, and I know the past events that I've attended, I just got to tell everybody watching, you feel like you are such a part of history in an event like this, you know, mm -hmm. that everybody and i and i hate that i'm one of these people you're taking pictures instead of paying attention you have to put the camera down and say take this all in yeah you know it, it, it's tough we had a tough problem with crowd control yeah the last time yeah um because you've got all of the airmen there mm -hmm. and people had come from all over our staff of volunteers was over a hundred people mm -hmm. and uh we had a hundred we had a hundred Civil Air Patrol, young men, Civil Air Patrol, and women that were there. And our motorcycle escort was at least, I don't know, 60, 60, maybe 70 Patriot Guard riders. Wow. And uh, it had to be 20 minutes before the coach with the airmen got there, the motorcycles mm -hmm. were coming for like 20 <laughs> minutes. Yeah. Police escort. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was a fabulous event. And I think what we're going to do for this event is we're going to acknowledge the past. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be showing video of Herb's interview oh, great. for the event. Mm -hmm. And the past events over the past basically 25 years that we've been doing events yeah. here. Yeah, we'll be sharing that. Yeah, well, and I, and I think everybody should attend uh, at this event or your future events. And as you mentioned, uh, remembering the past, I was hoping that you could tell us about the flag before we go in the background as well. Yes, so that flag is a very special flag. Um, back in 2009, on the 60th anniversary of the Tuskegee Airmen mm -hmm. winning the Air Force's first ever National Fighter Gunnery Competition, that flag was on display on a special tribute to Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., who was the commanding general. Uh, well, he was the commanding officer during World War II, commander of the Tuskegee Airmen. And uh, we honored him at that event. We had something which was actually, it was a reliquary for the church, the Roman Catholic Church in mm -hmm. town. Yeah. We brought it cross-country, and we set it up, with video that showed uh, details of his funeral. And we have this uh, special flag there. And that case is also very special because it has gorilla glass <laughs> cut by a I mean, special process that I patented from yeah. Corning Incorporated, a mechanical score and break process. And so this, this flag has been behind that glass after being mechanically cut for the past 15 years. Wow. And what would you say to people that are watching this today? How do they make sure this amazing legacy lives on? The way to do it is to share it with young people. Mm -hmm. I find that it, it's every two years, two or three years, yeah. people really don't know what you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> it's that new generation yeah. that they haven't seen the movies. Mm -hmm. You know, they have... You know, the, the last Tuskegee Airmen may have passed some time ago, and now we're getting to the, there are only a few mm -hmm. of these people left. Mm -hmm. And so there will come a time where there won't be any more funerals, and you won't see, you won't be able to see them give live interviews. Right. You know, at times rapidly approaching. So it's, it's on us and the Tuskegee Airmen Inc. and all of our allies, all of our, our partners, mm -hmm. You know, there are many different black 
uh, aviation organizations throughout the country. There are black motorcycle organizations. And some of these organizations, you don't have to be black to join. You don't have to be black to join Tuskegee Airmen Inc. or TAI, as we call it. All you have to do is care about preserving that history and that heritage and that pursuit of excellence reaching to the stars through adversity. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. I'm, I'm enthralled. I could have sat here and talked to you all day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could talk all day. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again. You're welcome. We'll be right back with our special presentation, Celebrating Black History Month. Located at 1248 Davis Street in Elmira, the John W. Jones Museum is an amazing experience. Well, the president of the Board of Trustees was kind enough to invite us and our cameras in for a tour and also to find out more about the amazing man, John W. Jones. All right, thank you so much for opening the museum for us today. Thank you for being here. Of course. Tell us right from the beginning, who was John W. Jones? So John W. Jones was a person who escaped the institution of slavery. He lived on a plantation in Virginia, and he settled in Elmira in 1844. John Jones is responsible for interring the Confederate soldiers that died in the Elmira prison camp. But more importantly, he was the station master and central figure in the Underground Railroad in Elmira. And he did this for nine years prior to the Civil War. He helped save over 800 men, women, and children all reached safety. None were reported captured. And just a little caveat, the Underground Railroad is not a railroad, of course, but John Jones did use the railroad. In fact, he used the railroad so often, a specific time that they called it the four o'clock, 4 a.m. freedom baggage car. He had made relationships with the baggage handlers, the conductors, to kind of get his baggage onto the train. So he did this during the dangerous fugitive slave law era. And he was never reprimanded. He was never penalized. And um, with the help of some local abolitionists like Jervis Langdon, um, that's Mark Twain's father-in-law, and um, Simeon Benjamin, he's a founder of Elmira College, one of the founders which was the first female college in the country. Mm -hmm. um, he was able to create the safe place for those escaping slavery. Isn't it amazing that you were able to save the house? Because I know at some point, um, and this is his house that we're about to enter, uh, but isn't it amazing that even though it was on the almost condemned, right, that right. they ended up saving it, what was it, just a concerned citizens that got together to save it? Right, right. Well, if you look over here, you'll see Lucy Brown's portrait. Yeah. Lucy Brown was doing some black history programming because um, she found there was a lack mm -hmm. through her granddaughter who was attending a local high school. So she started looking into the history of some significant um, figures in black history locally. Sure. And John Jones was just one. And somebody whispered in her ear that, do you know his house is going to be condemned? And they're getting this scheduled for demolition. And she was like, oh, that can't happen. So she made noise. It got public attention through the media. And the group of concerned citizens, like you said, yeah. um, got together to, one, save the house. So they approached the city. city of Elmira was fantastic in responding. And they immediately you know, got rid of that right to, to, to demolish it. So that group said, now we're going to do more. So they purchased the house. Then they moved the house to reposition it so that they could set it up to be a visitor museum. How long have you been with the museum? I have been on this board since 2020, oh, 2004. Oh, wow. 2004. And people may hear in the background there's some construction going on now. What kind of big plans do you have in the future for the John W. Jones Museum? You and I were talking off the air, but uh, the exciting <laughs> statue, you've got to be excited about this. Oh, my God. Gary Weissman, a renowned sculptor mm -hmm. um, who has works all over the world, and you can see some of them at Elmira College, mm -hmm. um, has created this fabulous sculpture. And you'll have to come back and see it because yes. I don't want to tip it. <laughs> but let's just say he's six foot eight, 850 pounds of bronze um, that will be installed wow. on our grounds um, honoring John Jones. So, yeah, we've worked three years to. Um, get it funded mm -hmm. 
and again the people of Elmira because I didn't even reach out to individuals you know we do an annual appeal I reached out to local private donors and, and, and foundations and they responded so I'm excited to say it's all funded and ready to be installed so um, we just put in the foundation I anticipate, and don't hold me to it, but I would really like something done around his birthday oh, okay. and unveiling. How do you receive funding? I mean, this is not free to run this museum, I'm sure. So how do you, do you look for donations? Absolutely. <laughs> donations are always appreciated. So I do an annual appeal, mm -hmm. um, which is just a letter, which kind of you know states, hi, here we are, this is what we've done. Um, our mission, we're fulfilling it, and you know, we, we need your help. Yeah. You know, historic preservation is expensive. Mm -hmm. um, we have been very blessed to have a good response to whoever's been exposed to the story or visited us. We've had people visit us. We have um, cross-pollination with the, um, the Civil War prison camp because John Jones is responsible for us having a national cemetery because he respectfully and compassionately interred 2,973 of the Confederate dead. People come here that are interested in the Civil War to trace their ancestry, mm -hmm. and John Jones has made it possible for them to visit a grave and that, that grave be identified. So um, we get visitors who also support us once they've come, and they're like, why don't we know about this? Mm -hmm. So our job is first to preserve the home of John Jones, and we want to do that so generations to come that it will always be here. And it is through the largesse of donations, grants. I've been wanting grants like crazy, and we'll talk about why, um, and, and, and local foundations. Um, we're going to stretch a little bit, but we are a volunteer organization, volunteer board, operates, manages, and maintains the museum. So. It is amazing, like you said, when you cross the threshold, how it feels, you know? Yeah, uh, you can see the transition. Yeah. This was an acquisition restoration project, so you can see these old boards. Mm -hmm. Obviously, these original and those nice, shiny, bright ones are new. The only reason we took them out is because it wouldn't hold weight. Oh. So we didn't want our visitors to fall through. But um, So what does the future hold for the, for the museum? So right now, we're raising a million dollars for what we call the Annex. Because as you can see, um, it's a modest space. Yeah. We want tourists to come. Mm -hmm. We want school kids to come. Um, the Elmira City School District has committed to sending their students, but we want to be able to accommodate them. As you can see, it's standing room only. Yeah. So the annex is designed to be a multifunctional room. Originally, our vision in the long term, the strategic plan is to add the Interpretation Center, which we will call the Lucy Brown, after the founder, Education and Heritage Center. Much heavier lift, much, more, much, much more expensive, and we need to be able to get more visitors in now. Um, since COVID introduced social distancing, mm -hmm. you technically, if you did the five to six foot thing, um, could only get five or six people in here. So um, we want classrooms to come. Mm -hmm. And right now, we are raising funds to get this room, the annex, built. Mm -hmm. It has a, a, a round, nice round figure of a million dollars. We have raised 700000 so far. So we just need a little bit more <laughs> help, just a little. So, so check out the website, right? Absolutely, <laughs> please. Um, you can. You can send checks. You can visit PayPal. Mm -hmm. um, on our website, um, there's a link to PayPal. Okay. So when you're uh, fundraising, because you and I were talking before, you do have fundraisers throughout the year. Where can people find out about those fundraisers? So our, we have two ways to raise funds. We have a year-end um, annual, not a year-end, but an annual appeal, which mm -hmm. is a letter. And it goes to our um, mail list. And okay. the mail list is generated by people who've either um, indicated interests, have done anything or donated in the past, mm -hmm. visited, that type of thing. So if people are interested, they could definitely reach out to our, our, our um, mailbox okay. to be included. Um, the second is, I used to, when I became president in 2016, I instituted a physical fundraiser. 
And for the first few years, I, it was kind of a sneaky way to get in programming. Sure. So I brought plays and speakers. But I decided the fundraisers should be F-U-N first, Razor, mm -hmm. fun. Mm -hmm. And it's a party with a purpose. Right. So I love jazz. This area seems to embrace jazz. Mm -hmm. So we have a fundraiser on, at the one of the historic places in Elmira, the um, Federal Courthouse, oh, yeah. which includes a rooftop that is fabulous mm -hmm. with fire pits, yeah. a huge courtroom, mm -hmm. a wonderful bar. Um, and we kind of just fellowship and get together to have a good time. And we bring in a couple of, of jazz bands. If someone wants to find out when you're open or hours or come visit, what's the best way to do that? Through our website. Um, that information will be posted. Sometimes it's a little slow because we're working on the technology and eventually we'll update our, our, um, our website and our Facebook. But um, so far, our hours have been, and we're lucky to have this, Monday, I'm sorry, Tuesday through Saturday, 12 to 5 from May through September. Okay. Okay. And just before we go, I'm going to ask you one tough question. What's your favorite part of the museum? I think standing in the main room because you get the feel that it's a sacred space. And I know that his hands touch the wallpaper and it means so much to be in the place that this fantastic, awesome American hero mm -hmm. lived. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for giving us so much time today. You're more than welcome. Come back. I, I love to talk about him, and I love to share it. And, you know, we want your viewership to come and visit us, too. When we're open, it is free <laughs> for admission, so please come. We hope you enjoy this special presentation, celebrating Black History Month. I'd like to thank our guests, historian for the Claude B. Govan chapter of the Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated, Michael Joseph. I'd like to thank the president of the NAACP on my recording chapter, Georgia Verdier. And we really hope you enjoyed that special inside look to the John W. Jones Museum. Find out more at johnwjonesmuseum.org. This has been Celebrating Black History Month on WYDC-TV, Big Fox.